Good evening, everyone. My name is Alan Solo. I'm a member of the Executive Committee of Israel Policy Forum. And it's my great pleasure to welcome to our Road Ahead program this evening, Ambassador Susan Rice. It would take up all of our allotted time tonight for me to recite all of Ambassador Rice's accomplishments. So by way of introduction, I wanna highlight just a few. Raised in our nation's capital, Ambassador Rice earned her undergraduate degree from Stanford, and then as a Rhodes Scholar went on to earn both her PhD and her master's at New College at Oxford. She served in the Clinton administration, in the National Security Council, and as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. And then during the Obama administration, she was confirmed as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations in 2009, and in 2013 became President Obama's National Security Advisor. Particularly during the Obama years, Israel and the Middle East were on her agenda with great frequency, and she brings an important perspective to this evening's conversation. I would add that the ambassador recently published an autobiography, Tough Love, and for those of you who are interested in understanding the inside view of how foreign policy is thought about and made in this country, I would highly recommend it to you. It's a great read. It made the New York Times bestseller list. Susan is also spending time as a distinguished visiting fellow at American University, as well as being a widely read opinion writer in the New York Times. So Ambassador, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Alan. It's great to be with you. And I'm glad to be part of the Israel Policy Forum's uh, session today. It's always great to be with you. So the first question I wanna to talk to you about this evening doesn't relate directly to the focus of our program, but it is of overwhelming importance to our country at this moment, and frankly, the entire world. Over the past month, we have seen a greater awareness of the longstanding prejudice against people of color. It seems that we are at somewhat of an inflection point with the polling approval of Black Lives Matters now even gaining majority support. That's certainly not a result that I would have expected just a few months ago. And it has come about because of a heightened awareness of the inequalities that exist in our society. There was a time in our country when blacks and Jews were publicly identified as close allies in the fight for racial equality. And I think it's fair to say that those relationships, while not totally frayed, have been under some stress. In reading your book, Tough Love, it was absolutely clear to me that so much of your worldview arises from the fact that you are a black woman, just as my own personal perspective comes out of the fact that I'm a Jewish American. I was hoping you should share, could share some comments this evening about how our communities might work together to address problems we can no longer ignore and what we can do to help make America reach its goal of being a more perfect union. Well, thank you, Alan. Thank you so much for asking that question. And you know, here we are talking just days after the celebration of Juneteenth uh, in the United States. And it's an opportunity for us to all reflect on our shared history, and in particular on how far we still have to go to realize the promise of true equality, including racial equality in this country. I'm old enough to remember the late 1960s, the 1970s uh, and beyond where our Jewish allies were with us every step of the way in the most difficult parts of the civil rights struggle. Um, we are peoples who have had the experience of systematic oppression uh, and nothing more horrific than the Holocaust and the legacy uh, of slavery in the United States. And out of that shared experience of oppression, we have historically had a bond where we have worked together for greater justice, for fights against racism and anti-Semitism. Um, and Alan, you and I have talked about this in the past. This has been something that has been meaningful to, to many of us uh, and to you and I in particular. My hope and prayer is that we can return to the day where African Americans are among the greatest uh, opponents and most vociferous critics of anti-Semitism and hate uh, and delegitimization 
of Israel and where Jewish Americans can again be right by the side of African Americans and young people and other people of color as we fight to make this country truly fully equal uh, and safe for all of us. We're all facing threats. Uh, the rising tide of anti-Semitism in this country is horrific. The revelations about the persistence of racism and police brutality and the systematic inequalities that we now all see, uh, even if it were evident to some of us, if not all of us, call us to work together. Call us to make this a more just and fair society together. And there's so much work to be done. We've been focused of late quite appropriately on police brutality and the criminal justice system and the reforms that are necessary there. And I think the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which is now before Congress introduced uh, largely by the Democrats is an important starting point. But when you look at COVID-19 and the disparate economic and health impacts uh, on African Americans and other people of color, we must all recognize that, that we have got enormous work still to do in reforming our education system, our healthcare system, um, our housing, um, job opportunities, our environment. And I really do hope that in an era where we so need to come together as a nation to deal with a wide swath of problems, that at the core of that coming together can again be a partnership that is rooted in history and common interests and common values, I believe, between African Americans and Jewish Americans. Thank you for that. You know, we both have an old colleague who used to say, never let a crisis go to waste. And so we're at a point where, unfortunately, now we have an opportunity to look anew again at the issues that you point to, which cry out for partnership. And I hope that your words will inspire those of us who are listening to you tonight to join the fight and take action so that we beat back this terrible scourge of prejudice and unfairness that has been part of our history of our country. And the first step, obviously, is to recognize that and acknowledge it. And then the second step, which is necessary, is to do something about it. And certainly we can be more effective if we do that together than if we do that separately. So I'm delighted that the timing of this worked out so that we could address this issue at least a little bit uh, this evening in the context of uh, other subjects which uh, we're going to cover as well. So thank you again for those words. I want to turn to uh, the principal topic of tonight, and that is the road ahead uh, for Israel. And we look at the possibility of a, a partial or total annexation of the West Bank by uh, Israel as early as July 1, and what the possible implications of that are. I know, of course, from having worked with you that you had close relationships with your Israeli colleagues, very close relationships during your time at the United Nations and uh, also during the time period when you served as National Security Advisor. And one of the things that you've always been a strong advocate for has been the two-state solution between Israel and the Palestinian people. I thought we might begin by you explaining to us tonight why you think that is such an important principle and perhaps then comment on what you think the consequences of annexation would be for the possibility of achieving that goal. Well, Alan, you know, the, as you well know, this is the core question. Um, and I'm a huge believer in the two-state solution for the very simple reason that I know no other way to ensure that Israel can remain Jewish and democratic. And from the very first time I visited Israel at 14 years old, uh, with my little brother and my dad, uh, when we spent a, a week uh, going all over that beautiful country from uh, Masada uh, to Yad Vashem, um, it was and is a state and a people whose future and integrity as a Jewish and democratic state I feel strongly about and I know we have a deep-seated national security interest in. Our values align with Israel. Our alliance with Israel, Alan, is, is not about expedience. It's about values and interests and a shared commitment to the principle of Israel and the security of Israel. And 
there's no other way to preserve that Jewish state and its democratic nature without a two-state solution. Now, I understand that there are many pressures and militating factors that are making that harder and harder to achieve. But for that to be lost as the objective we all seek, that we continue to strive for, means that fundamentally, either Israel will no longer be able to sustain itself as a Jewish state, or it no, will no longer be able to sustain itself as a democracy. And in my estimation, either outcome is one we have to try to avoid at all costs. So when it comes to annexation, I think the obvious uh, argument against it is that it all but makes that objective of a two-state outcome impossible. And there's so many other negative aspects to it as well. I mean, first of all, it would alienate Israel from its neighbors, in particular from Jordan, where the pressures uh, will be very, very great um, ag against the annexation to the Arab and Gulf states who have in recent years opened the door to a new kind of relationship with Israel that could be mutually beneficial. They have said very explicitly that that kind of move would put a, a major roadblock in the way of enhanced coordination and, and cooperation. Uh, it would alienate the Europeans and it would make the pressure on Israel in international fora uh, almost impossible to withstand. And here in the United States, it would make uh, the, the traditionally bipartisan strong support for Israel that much harder to sustain. Um, and then of course, the impact on the Palestinians themselves and the risk that a fragmented, you know, Swiss cheese, uh, area for them to inhabit becomes absolutely unsustainable and potentially provokes um, a, another intifada on so many levels. It is a risky outcome uh, that, that is not necessary for any strategic purpose in my judgment, but more as a political statement. And the negative consequences for Israel's security for its standing in the region, for its relationships with the rest of the world, as well as for American interests, uh, is hard to overstate. I'm uh, especially appreciative of the fact that you uh, mentioned shared values. That's something that's run across your career, whether it was uh, during the Clinton administration and your work with the African continent and the countries there or whether it was in the Middle East with Israel. I know that you and I happen to be uh, in Israel twice together uh, during the course of your service in the Obama administration. And uh, the last uh, time we traveled there together uh, was to the funeral of our mutual good friend, Shimon Peres. And we spent some time uh, on the way back uh, talking about his role in those shared values and the impact uh, that that had on you and uh, the many friends that you had made over the years uh, amongst Israelis. So I know this comes from the heart and, uh, and I think it is critical uh, to the relationship. Absolutely. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about this from the American strategic uh, point of view. I know that especially during your years in the United Nations, you used to talk about the almost uh, daily uh, encounters you would have with your counterparts from around the world uh, dealing with uh, issues uh, which I would broadly characterize as being around the delegitimization of Israel and the role that the United States was able to play as uh, Israel's strong friend in uh, beating back those types of attacks. And so one of the things that I'm wondering about is whether or not you believe that an annexation would uh, have a negative impact on the United States' ability to do that, and that whether or not that might not only impact on what the United States would be able to do for Israel, but also would cause the United States to have to do some reexamination of how it interacts with its friends in places like Europe more broadly, where this has been kind of one of the fundamentals of the everyday relationship with the Europeans. Well, Alan, as UN ambassador, I was proud to, to fight every day of my tenure uh, for Israel's security and legitimacy. And that often meant you know, fighting a lonely battle uh, in the United Nations where many countries uh, took a very different view and look for opportunities to 
uh, attack Israel uh, on, on various grounds, uh, mostly specious. And, uh, you know, I'll give you one example uh, of where having partners that we could rely on made a huge difference. I mean, yes, the United States has a veto uh, in the Security Council, and we have used it, including in the Obama administration when we felt it was necessary. Um, but it, it, it's far better where the United States can act in concert with other countries to stand up for the legitimacy and security of Israel. Um, and, you know, during my tenure, we had a, a whole range of challenges um, from the, the Goldstone Report to the Turkish flotilla uh, to the World Conference on Racism. I mean, I could go on and on. We, the Human Rights Council. Um, and then, of course, the Palestinian bid for statehood. And the view that the United States took under President Obama was that statehood needed to come, a Palestinian statehood needed to come through a negotiated solution, not through arbitrary or, or uh, circumventing action at the United Nations. And uh, we were able to sustain that position within the Security Council without having to cast a veto because we were able to uh, assure that enough other countries joined with us in opposition to that premature uh, unilateral move on the part of the Palestinians um, by bringing enough other countries to our side so that there was a not a, a sufficient majority of nine in the Security Council to necessitate the use of a veto. And that's what we want on these issues. We don't want the United States out there alone, isolated uh, on any issue of significance, but particularly one that implicates the security and the legitimacy of Israel. We want to be part of a broader coalition um, that involves our European partners and many other countries uh, from various parts of the world. And we have been able to do that uh, when we have utilized diplomacy effectively and when we have um, been able to bring other countries along with us. In the context of annexation, we've already heard from various European partners uh, that this would be a, a game changer in terms of their relationship with Israel and in terms of how they approach these matters in multilateral fora. That is not a good thing for the United States. That's not a good thing for Israel. Uh, and it's, it certainly doesn't serve American or Israeli interests in my judgment. The last thing I want to ask you about goes uh, back to some of your earlier remarks about the region. And of course, as national security advisor and as the United Nations ambassador, you dealt not only with Israel in the region, but also its many neighbors. And you particularly pointed uh, out the pressures that you thought that this would place on King Abdullah and the government in Jordan. And that uh, government uh, faces uh, multiple problems. Uh, not only do they uh, have a border with Israel, but they also have a border with Syria. They've had a huge influx of Syrian refugees. And I thought perhaps you might comment on uh, what annexation might threaten to do uh, to the stability of an important uh, country like Jordan. Uh, and what impact it might have uh, on other neighbors, and then again, how that plays a role in the United States policy uh, towards the Middle East and what we should be reasonably expecting from our friends and allies. Well, nobody knows better than uh, the, the people on this video in the Israel, Israel Policy Forum how important the stability of the, the wider region is, both for Israel's security and for our national security interests. And Jordan is a linchpin um, of our relationships in that region. And with such a large Palestinian population, that's highly likely to react very negatively to annexation. That could be highly destabilizing for Jordan. Uh, and you know, already Jordan is a, a country whose economic uh, fragility is of concern. It's in a very tough neighborhood, and yet it's a very important partner of the United States and indeed of Israel. Uh, and so it would be counterproductive and contrary to our interests for actions to be taken that would exacerbate instability inside of Jordan uh, and also um, pit other 
neighbors in the region, other Arab neighbors and Gulf neighbors, uh, by necessity, if not by desire, on the opposite side of Israel on such a fundamental issue. So all told, uh, this would uh, add up to a net negative for the United States and our interests in the region, and I believe over the long term, a net negative for Israel. Ambassador Susan Rice, thank you for joining Israel Policy Forum this evening. It's always such a pleasure to hear from you. I will say that every time we have a chance to get together, I learn more, and I think I become smarter about the issues that we discuss, and I'm absolutely sure that those who have the opportunity to listen to what you said tonight will have the same takeaway that I did. So always grateful for your service to our country and for your willingness to engage in candid conversation. Thank you for all you've done. And we'll Thank you do. so much for having me, Alan. Thank you to the Israel Policy Forum. Thank you for your leadership.